Imagine a world where survival is a daily gamble. No hospitals, no antibiotics, no grocery stores, just you, your tribe, and a wilderness teeming with predators. Now picture an old man, toothless, his back bent with arthritis, sitting by a fire, telling stories of hunts long past. You'd think he's an anomaly, a miracle in a world where everyone dies young. But what if I told you he wasn't rare? What if our prehistoric ancestors, humans from 1.8 million years ago to 30,000 years ago, didn't just scrape by but lived long, meaningful lives, some reaching 70, 80, or more? And what if the reason we've believed otherwise is a single misleading number? Today, we're diving into a story that rewrites history. Forget the caveman stereotypes of short, brutal lives. Archaeological discoveries and modern studies reveal a shocking truth. Prehistoric humans often grew old, cared for by their communities, and their longevity challenges everything we think we know about humanity. This isn't just about bones and numbers, it's about what makes us human. Stick with me for a journey through time, from the caves of Neanderthals to the wisdom of modern hunter-gatherers, and discover why our ancestors' lives matter to us today. Hit that subscribe button, and let's uncover the truth together. We've all heard it. Prehistoric humans died young, barely making it past 30. It's a story painted in pop culture, cavemen clubbing each other, succumbing to disease, or being mauled by saber-toothed cats. But this image is a myth, born from a misunderstanding of one statistic, average life expectancy. Let's break it down. The off-sighted 30-year life expectancy for prehistoric humans sounds scientific, but it's a trap. It's an average, and averages can lie. In ancient societies, child mortality was staggeringly high. 30 to 50% of children died before age five from malnutrition, infections, or accidents. If half the population dies young, it drags the average down, even if adults live much longer. Picture this, in a group of 10 people, five died age two and five lived to 60. The average, 31 years. But those who survive childhood, they're hitting their 60s. This isn't speculation, it's math. Archaeology backs this up. Skeletons from prehistoric sites show signs of advanced age. Teeth ground down from decades of chewing, spines curved with arthritis, bones healed from old injuries. These aren't the remains of 20-somethings. They're grandparents, great-grandparents, people who lived long enough to carry the weight of years. My take? This challenges our arrogance. We assume modern medicine invented longevity, but our ancestors were defying death in a world far harsher than ours. The short life myth paints prehistoric humans as primitive, barely human. But if they were living into their 70s, cared for by their tribes, what does that say about their societies? Their values? Their humanity? It's not just about survival. It's about connection, compassion, and community. As we peel back the layers, we'll see that longevity isn't a modern invention. It's woven into our DNA. Archaeologists have unearthed clues that rewrite the story of prehistoric life. In Demonacy, Georgia, a 1.8 million year old Homo erectus skull, nicknamed the Old Man of Demonacy, was found with just one tooth. His jaw showed healed sockets, meaning he lived years after losing his ability to chew. How? Someone fed him, likely softening food or pre-chewing it. This wasn't a one-off. In Shanadar Cave, Iraq, a Neanderthal known as Shanadar I lived 45,000 years ago. He was disabled, blind in one eye, deaf in one ear, with a paralyzed arm, yet reached his 40s or 50s. His survival depended on others sharing food and protecting him. Fast forward to 30,000 years ago in France, Cro-Magnon I and early Homo sapiens had arthritis, tumors, and deformities, but lived to around 50. His burial alongside other elderly individuals included tools and talismans, suggesting respect, not abandonment. These cases aren't outliers. Across sites we find elderly remains, their bones telling stories of care in a brutal world. These discoveries flip the script. We often view prehistoric life as survival of the fittest, but these stories scream compassion. Caring for the vulnerable, those who couldn't hunt or fight, required sacrifice. It meant less food for others, more effort to protect the weak. 
yet they did it. Why? I believe it's because humans, even 1.8 million years ago, saw value beyond utility. They didn't just survive, they built communities where love and loyalty trumped pragmatism. I once read about a study on empathy in primates. Chimpanzees will share food, but only if it benefits them. Humans, we share even when it costs us. That's what I see in these ancient bones, a spark of humanity that sets us apart. It's humbling to think that, long before writing or cities, our ancestors were practicing kindness in ways we still struggle to match. This is the story of Nara, the prehistoric girl who became independent. Nara left the shelter at dawn, the air still thick with mist, clutching the stone-tipped spear her father once used. She followed a narrow stream, eyes scanning the soft earth for fresh tracks. Hours passed before she spotted a young antelope separated from its herd, grazing near the trees. She dropped low, crawling on her belly, hiding behind scrub and stone. When the wind shifted and the animal raised its head, she let the spear fly. It struck deep into its shoulder. The creature staggered and ran, blood marking its trail. Nara pursued, breath steady, until it collapsed from exhaustion. She knelt beside it, placing a hand gently on its brow in a quiet farewell. With careful hands, she carved meat, wrapped organs in hide, and began the journey home. That night, by firelight, her tribe looked at her differently, with the quiet respect of a true hunter. To understand prehistoric longevity, let's look at modern hunter-gatherer societies, like the Hadza of Tanzania or the Kunga Botswana. These groups live without electricity, hospitals, or supermarkets, much like our ancestors. A landmark study across 12 such communities found that 63% of children reached age 15. Of those, 68% lived to at least 45, with many reaching their 60s or 70s. The most common age of death, around 72 with some living to 78. Without modern medicine, these people are outliving many in industrialized nations from just a century ago. How? For one, their lifestyles, constant movement, diverse diets, and small scattered populations kept infectious diseases at bay. Unlike urban societies where viruses spread like wildfire, hunter-gatherers rarely faced pandemics. But it's not just biology. Their social structures prioritized care. Elders weren't cast out, they were revered as storytellers, healers, and guides. Let's bring this to life with a story. Meet Naxao, a Kung elder I read about in an anthropologist's memoir. At 75, he couldn't hunt, but his knowledge of water sources saved his group during a drought. He'd memorized every trickle in the Kalahari, learned over decades. His tribe didn't see him as a burden. They saw him as their GPS. This mirrors what we see in prehistoric evidence. Elders as living libraries, their memories ensuring survival. This shows that longevity wasn't about physical strength, but social value. In our world, we often measure worth by productivity. Can you work, earn, contribute? But prehistoric societies valued wisdom. And elders' stories could mean the difference between life and death. I wonder if we've lost something here. How often do we dismiss our own elders, assuming their knowledge is outdated? Maybe our ancestors were onto something. If so many lived long, why did some die young? Data from hunter-gatherer studies gives us answers. 70% of deaths were from diseases like malaria or pneumonia, 20% from accidents or violence, think falls or tribal conflicts, and 9% from old age. Most didn't die because they aged, they died before they could. But here's the kicker. In isolated groups, infectious diseases were rare. Small populations and constant movement meant viruses struggled to spread. No measles, no smallpox, just nature's challenges. In 2019, I saw a documentary about the Sentinelese, an uncontacted tribe in the Andaman Islands. They've resisted outsiders for centuries, and guess what? They show no signs of modern diseases. But when outsiders accidentally introduced measles to other tribes, entire communities were decimated. This tells me prehistoric humans, living in small bands, likely faced fewer epidemics than we assume. Their biggest threats were injuries or parasites, not plagues. 
This highlights a paradox. We think of prehistoric life as deadly, but urban living brought new risks, crowding, sanitation issues, and trade routes that spread disease. Our ancestors' mobility was their shield. It makes me question our modern obsession with stability. Are we trading resilience for convenience? Food for thought. Elders weren't just survivors. They were the backbone of prehistoric societies. Without books or Google, they were the internet, storing knowledge of seasons, herbs, and survival tactics. Among the Inuit, elders read animal fur to predict weather, guiding hunts. In the Amazon, Shuar elders knew which plants healed wounds, passing down rituals no textbook could teach. In Australia, Yolngu elders resolve conflicts, their wisdom preventing wars. Here's a personal story. My grandmother at 85 once told me how her village survived a flood in the 1950s. She remembered which hills stayed dry, guiding her family to safety. That's the kind of knowledge elders carried. Practical, life-saving, irreplaceable. I see the same in prehistoric elders. They weren't burdens, they were anchors. This reverence for elders suggests a social contract we've forgotten. Prehistoric groups invested in their old because they knew survival depended on memory. Today, we outsource knowledge to AI or Wikipedia, but what do we lose when we sideline human experience? I think our ancestors understood something profound. A community without elders is a ship without a compass. Not every elder could be kept. In times of famine or harsh winters, some chose to leave voluntarily. Among the Inuit, elders sometimes walked into the snow, sparing their families. In African and Australian tribes, elders stopped eating during droughts, wandering off to die. This wasn't abandonment, it was sacrifice. Imagine a grandmother in a prehistoric Arctic camp. Food is gone, the children are starving, and she knows her presence means one less meal for them. She slips out at dawn, her heart heavy but resolute. Her choice ensures her grandchildren live. It's tragic, but it's also heroic. I'm awed by that selflessness. Could I make that choice? Could you? Geronticide wasn't cruelty, it was love in its purest form. It reminds me of soldiers falling on grenades to save their squad. These elders didn't die in vain. They bought time for the next generation. Their legacy is our existence. The thread tying these stories together is compassion. From the toothless Homo erectus to the disabled Neanderthal, prehistoric humans cared for those who couldn't contribute. Why? Not for gain, but because it's who we are. I believe this is humanity's defining trait. Not fire, not tools, but the instinct to protect the vulnerable. I volunteer at a local nursing home, and I see echoes of this ancient care. An 80-year-old woman, bedridden, lights up when her family visits. Her stories, mundane to some, keep her connected. Our ancestors knew this. Worth isn't tied to utility. They fed the weak, carried the old, buried their dead with care. That's not just survival, that's love. In a world obsessed with efficiency, we risk forgetting this. We measure people by output, not heart. But our ancestors, with nothing but stone tools, chose compassion over convenience. If they could do it, why can't we? We started with a myth. Prehistoric humans died young. But the truth is richer. Many lived long, cared for by communities that valued wisdom over strength. From the old man of Dimenisi to modern hunter-gatherers, our ancestors showed that longevity and compassion are human instincts, not modern inventions. They faced death daily, yet chose to carry their elders, share their food, and honor their dead. The snow swept over the tundra in slow, deliberate sheets, blanketing the world in silence. There were no carved names, no headstones or monuments here, only wind, stone, and memory. Yet something endured. It lived in the shape of the land, in the curve of footprints filling with frost, and in the ancient, unwritten pattern of those who had walked into the snow before. Sara had weathered 62 winters. In a world where few saw more than 30, she had become a living archive. Her face was marked by time, her fingers twisted from years of work. Her body, though bowed and brittle, still bore the strength of presence. Her teeth had worn down to the gums long ago, 
but her mind remained sharper than any spear. She had witnessed the migration of mammoths, the rise and fall of rivers, and the passing of her own kin. Brothers lost to fever, a daughter to birth, her husband to a bad winter. Her memory carried the weight of generations. It was not just recollection, it was preservation. Now she lived in a low shelter built against a hillside, sharing warmth and breath with the last of her family, her daughter, Mira, Myra's two children, and a young hunter named Jono, recovering poorly from a failed hunt. The food stores had dwindled to a final pouch of dried moss and bark. No meat had been seen in days. The children had begun to cough. Their bellies, once round with health, were shrinking. Sarah watched in stillness. Her body could no longer fetch water. Her hands could no longer skin hides. She was one mouth too many. Outside, the wind howled. The fire inside the shelter had been reduced to embers, banked carefully to last until morning. In the shadows, Myra clutched her children close. They slept, unaware of what the dawn might bring. Sarah rose in the night. Her movements were slow but purposeful. She gathered her furs, thick and worn with age, and packed nothing else. Her fingers briefly touched the comb that had followed her through decades, its surface smoothed by time, its teeth counted like notches of survival. She left it behind. The snow greeted her like an old acquaintance. The cold slid beneath her furs, but she didn't shiver. Her body understood this final journey. Each step was careful, deliberate. Her footprints vanished behind her as the wind covered them. She walked into the darkness with no light, no tools, no farewell. Hours passed. The sky lightened only slightly, shifting from deep black to pale gray. The land opened into a hollow between two ridges. It was a place she remembered, not from this season, but from a lifetime ago. It had once sheltered her during a storm, and she had once buried kin in its frozen soil. 